We're talking about C.S. Lewis again in light of the coming Desiring God National Conference devoted to Lewis's legacy later this fall. Uh, Pastor John, you met, in a sense, C.S. Lewis in 1964, a year after he died. How did you meet him? What were your early thoughts of his works? As I've tried to ponder Lewis's impact on me, my memory is not good enough to be completely accurate about this. So, so let, me, let me answer it this way. From 1964, when I went to Wheaton College as an 18-year-old, to 1968, Wheaton College, Clyde Kilby, professor of Romantic Literature, the foremost Lewis scholar in America at that time, and C.S. Lewis in his writings all merge into one big impact. So it's very hard for me to sort out, was it Lewis, was it Kilby, was it the very atmosphere of Wheaton? But, but here, here's... Here are the pieces that I recall as as exploding with significance for me in those four years. And I would here are the key words: uh, lucidity or, or lucid, logical, illuminating, large-hearted, <laughs> joyful longing. All those L's. And here, here they are. I just give you a, a nutshell, a, a little bullet with each one. Lucid. Lewis was a man of crystal clarity in his thinking and writing. Definitions really mattered to Lewis. What you don't mean matters. So he made clear, here's what I don't mean, not just what I do mean. People get clear if you hear them say, I don't mean this and I do mean this. If you leave out the don't, you don't really get what they're saying usually. Um, A whole worldview lies behind Lewis's crystal clarity clarity. He loves to say what he thinks, and he wants you to know what he thinks. He's not piddling around with fancy efforts at ambiguity to leave you hanging in midair. He really has views of things, and he wants you to see them, and he's good at it. And secondly, there's there's logic. I was a philosophy minor at Wheaton. Lewis taught philosophy for at least a year at Oxford before he became professor of medieval literature, and he was simply brilliant in his relentless exposure of shoddy thinking. I had a teacher like that, Stuart Hackett at Wheaton, that I just love because he took the law of non-contradiction and he applied it so effectively to all the views that vaunted themselves over Jesus Christ. Lewis saw saw holes everywhere in weak arguments, and he was amazingly constructive not just destructive. In other words, when he when he wrecked somebody's argument, he was building something. He didn't take pleasure in just putting things down or getting things out of the way. He was one of the most constructive writers. And so it was uh, this logic that I loved so much. We find we find reality. Lewis finds reality. Um, in all of its blazing, glorious, dazzling thereness, and he wants to uh, make it plain. He really believes there is a God, really believes there is a world, really believes there is um, logic that is above the merely opinionated minds of man. He's not just dabbling in sophomoric fascination with thoughts. He was serious about finding what's really there he wasn't just searching he loved answers more more than he loved questions he, he loved helping people know god not just provoking them with uncertainties it seems to me like in those days when i was at wheaton and even today intellectual people tended to play a lot of games and they thought they were being profound if they created questions in your heads that they couldn't answer Lewis wasn't like that. He loved the church. He loved people. He wanted to help people with his with his mind, and he used his amazing logic for it. And and the next one is uh, illuminating. Lewis can't touch anything without shedding light on it. He he saw. He had eyes. He had this gift of concrete, tasteable, feelable, smellable, hearable words that made the page radiant with with insight. So he just illuminated everything that he touched. And and two more thoughts. Large hearted. Lewis saw the whole world as worth seeing. 
everything was interesting to Lewis. Everywhere he looked, he saw something worth celebrating. He wasn't, he wasn't a crank. He wasn't a misfit. He wasn't a naysayer. He was a, a happy, large-hearted, capacious soul. And yet he believed in evil. He believed in sin. He believed in wickedness. But beauty dominated his eyes. Uh, uh, he had seen war. He went to war. He got wounded. He knew what it was like to be a scholar in the midst of wartime. He wrote about it. But he wasn't soured by it. And so as, a, as a, I was a pretty sour teenager, I really was. I was hypercritical. I was ingrown. And Lewis was just a breath of air for me. It was so healthy to get me out of myself and out of my, my selfishness and my critical spirit because of the large-hearted beauty he saw everywhere. And, and the last thing is, is uh, longing. Lewis was led to Christ by, in a large measure, by his longings, the achings of his heart for something he knew not what. And I'll tell you, as an 18, 19, 20-year-old, I felt like just one big cauldron of desire and, and longing and aching. And so I felt an amazing kinship. kinship. When, I, when I read the, the uh, Surprise by Joy and how the quest for, for joy brought him to Christ, everything in me said, I need to know this man. Christianity for Lewis was the answer to every longing of the human heart. So those those are some of the pieces, Tony, that t to this very day, this man is having a profound influence on the way I see the world. Hmm. Thank you, Pastor John. We will be studying the enduring influence of C.S. Lewis later this fall on September 27, 28, and 29 here in Minneapolis at the Desiring God National Conference. The conference is titled The Romantic Rationalist, God, Life, and Imagination in the Work of C.S. Lewis. More details and registration will be available soon at DesiringGod.org on the blog and under the Events tab. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. Thanks for listening.